Okay, good morning everyone, and uh, for the UVM students here, welcome to the, the last week of the semester. Um, before we uh, get back to evolutionary robotics uh, this morning, just uh, we have several housekeeping notes. Um, the first one I wanted to point out is obviously we are uh, nearing the end of the semester, and, and what a semester it's been. And I just wanted to say that I'm very proud of all of you for uh, doing your best to adapt. I know some of you are trying to continue following this course under less than ideal uh, circumstances. I realize that uh, learning new material, uh, especially in an upper year course, can be particularly stressful and anxiety inducing, especially under the current circumstances. So I appreciate your patience with myself and other faculty as we adapt to uh, try and deliver uh, material to you remotely. So uh, while we're on the topic of remote delivery, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the oral presentations today. And as you can see uh, in the schedule here, we are going to be hosting or we're going to be running the oral presentations not here in Twitch. We are going to be running them in a Zoom meeting. We are going to do a dry run of that in a moment. So in a few minutes, I am going to shut down the stream for 10 minutes and for all the UVM students. You're going to be moving to a Zoom meeting where we are just going to test uh, that everything works okay in that Zoom meeting. You don't need to prepare anything. We're just going to uh, do a dry run. I want to see whether it works. Uh, we'll be there for 10 minutes and then we will come back uh, to the Twitch stream. Assuming that dress rehearsal, that 10 minute dress rehearsal works, I will uh, write up or adapt the uh, instructions for preparing your oral presentations and we will walk through those oral presentation instructions next Thursday. Sound good? Okay, a uh, couple other housekeeping notes. Uh, again, for the UVM students, you'll notice in the uh, middle, uh, great, in the middle bottom of the, the stream video, um, there's a link to course evaluations. Uh, again, this has been a very non-typical semester, so faculty always uh, welcome student feedback. Please do fill out that course evaluation form. As you can imagine, those course evaluation forms will be particularly useful to us uh, this semester to get a feel for how well we did at uh, adapting to remote instruction. So I realize you have a lot to do this week and next week. Please take five or ten minutes uh, out of your day to fill out the course evaluation for this class. I definitely take those course evaluations seriously and uh, assuming the, uh, the comments are valid, I do try and adapt the course uh, for next year. So by filling out those course evaluations, you're not necessarily helping me, but the students that take this course uh, next year. Okay, so um, again, before we get back into lecture, what I'd like to do now is to do the 10 minute dress rehearsal of oral presentations. Let me just describe very briefly what's going to happen. Um, in a moment, I am going to shut down uh, the Twitch stream for about 10 minutes. For the UVM students, if you go to Blackboard, uh, in Blackboard, there's an announcement, and in that announcement, there is a link to a Zoom meeting. So when I hang up the stream here, I want you to go to Blackboard, click on the link, and join me in uh, a Zoom meeting. What you're going to see in the Zoom meeting, I am going to share my screen, and I am going to run a YouTube playlist. That YouTube playlist has a number of short videos in it. Uh, everyone's mic is going to be muted. You will also see a list of students. And when I point to your name in the list, I'd like you to unmute your mic, just say hello, just your name, uh, and, then mic, uh, and then mute your mic again. So the basic idea of the oral presentations, what you're going to see on the screen is a continuously running YouTube playlist with three minute silent videos in it. When it's your turn in the schedule, and you'll see the schedule in the Zoom meeting, when it's your turn in the schedule, you unmute your mic talk over your video, and then mute your mic again. That's the basic idea. If that makes sense, please type yes into chat, just so I know I'm making sense. Okay, so it is now uh, 8.35 a.m., so I'm gonna, st I'm, gonna shut off the, uh, I'm gonna shut off the Twitch stream. Uh, we will come back here at exactly 8.45 uh, AM, UVM students, go to Blackboard, click on the Zoom meeting link in the announcements, and I will see you there. Everyone else, see you back here in 10 minutes. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, I can't see whether anyone has rejoined the Twitch stream. If you're back here from the Zoom meeting, please type uh, yes in chat. Ah, okay, there we go. Yes, I see everyone's here. Okay, great. All right, thanks for that. Uh, that seems to work, so we will hold the oral presentations in the Zoom meeting uh, next Monday. I will write up the instructions for that, and then we'll walk through those instructions on Thursday. Thanks very much. Okay, so uh, we are almost finished our, uh, our tour of the field of evolutionary robotics. We will finish uh, lecture 28 now on morphological innovation protection or the MIP algorithm. Just as a reminder, we're uh, looking at evolutionary algorithms where we broaden the evolutionary algorithm and allow it to simultaneously improve the body plan and the neural controller uh, of robots. We saw the first attempt to do that in lecture 26. I gave you one example about why you might want to create such an algorithm in the first place in lecture 27. And in lecture 28, we were looking at um, a, hidden, a hidden aspect of this, which is once you do broaden the evolutionary algorithm and allow it to gradually modify body plan and controller, if you don't do it well, it's very difficult for evolution to make progress. And what I mean by that is if evolution makes a mutation to the body plan and changes the body plan without a corresponding change in the neural controller of the robot, the child robot is very unlikely to do well and is usually swept out of the population. And therefore, it is very difficult for evolu the evolutionary algorithm to make any gradual improvements to the body plan. So we're looking at some work from a former student uh, who took this course a few years ago, Nick Cheney, and he created uh, a particular evolutionary algorithm called Morphological Innovation Protection, or MIP, which as the name implies is an evolutionary algorithm that tries to protect morphological innovations. So just very quickly as a reminder, imagine we have a cartoon biped like this. It produces a child robot that has this mutation, longer legs. It's, le it's likely to fall over and get less fitness than its parent, indicated by the shorter gray arrow, arrow and therefore swept out of the population. But if this morphological uh, innovation, if this child robot can be protected, it may in turn produce children, uh, or a child robot like the one you see here that has a control mutation, and that control mutation allows, the, may just by chance allow the controller to operate this new body better, not only than the parent, but even better than the grandparent. Okay, so that's the intuition behind the MIP algorithm, and then we we're looking at how that's implemented. It's implemented using multi-objective optimization. And just as a reminder, we, in, in Mu, we have more than one fitness uh, objective. In the transferability project, we were trying to maximize the transferability of controllers and maximize behavior and creating this Pareto front that is trying to push up and to the right. We then looked at a different type of multi-objective optimization algorithm, a different Mu algorithm last time called AFPO. AFPO works by, uh, by allowing multiple species to exist in the same population, as we saw here, uh, uh, multiple species in the same population, which allows Individuals from a new species, like the blue species here, even if these blue robots are less fit than these red robots that have been around for longer, they're protected due to their youngness, the youngness of their lineage. And uh, as they get older and older, if, if their, the innovation or whatever is inside this blue population is eventually improved by evolution to the point that the blue robots are doing better than the red robots, the blue robots uh, take over the population and the red lineage dies out. So the AFPO algorithm protects new material by uh, using multi-objective optimization. That's AFPO. It has nothing to do with evolving bodies and brains. It's a general evolutionary algorithm. But the MIP algorithm builds on top of AFPO by swapping out in AFPO the age of lineage and swapping in a different type of age or a different time, a, a different a different type of age, which is for any individual 
robot in the population? How many generations back in its own lineage, in its ancestry, does it have to go before it finds an individual that suffered a morphological mutation? So in this cartoon example here, this particular robot was produced by a morphological mutation. There are zero generations uh, since this robot has ex uh, zero generations since this robot has experienced a morphological mutation. This robot over here, um, its grandparent suffered a morphological mutation. Its parent suffered a control mutation and th this robot itself suffered a control mutation. So you've got to go two generations back until you find a robot that suffered a morphological mutation. This one, its parent suffered a morphological mutation, and it, this robot itself suffered a control mutation. So you only need to go back one generation to find a robot in this robot's uh, ancestry that had a morphological mutation. So uh, I ended last time, I think, by showing you this picture. So imagine we have this robot here. It produces this child robot, which suffers a morphological mutation. So it has an age of zero. Although this robot, uh, is, this robot is, has very poor fitness, one over fitness is, is a very high value. So even though it has poor fitness, it is not swept out of the population because it is on the Pareto front. In this case, we are trying to minimize both objectives, meaning we're trying to push lower and to the left. So even though this longer-legged child robot, compared to this robot, its parent robot down here, even though the child robot has a much worse fitness than its parent, this multi, the, the fact that they're Pareto optimal, neither is better than the other, protects the child, and perhaps the child in turn produces yet another child, so this robot is the grandchild of this robot. This grandchild has to go back one generation to find an ancestor that suffered a morphological mutation, which was its parent up here. This robot suffers a control mutation, and we're assuming in the cartoon example here that perhaps this control mutation allows this robot to travel further than its parent does. This point is lower than this point is. That's the idea. Okay. Uh, we saw last time that Nick applied this MIP algorithm to uh, soft robots. Uh, and we looked at these soft robots last time. Unlike in PyroSim, uh, in VoxCAD, which is the soft robot simulator we're looking at here, robots are not made up of rigid cylinders connected by joints. They're made up of soft voxels that can increase or decrease their volume. Just as a reminder, a voxel is a 3D uh, pixel. Oops. Let me just skip ahead a little. So in this video here, we're watching uh, the best individual in the population at every uh, generation. So we have evolutionary time along the horizontal axis and fitness measured in distance along the vertical axis. And as you can see here, evolution is exploring the space of all possible soft robots made up of these voxels. So it's exploring uh, soft robots with different uh, geometries, different shapes, and also different distributions of material properties. Just going to pause here. I see there's a question in chat from Daniel. Um, is the number of generations required for a morphological change to occur fixed, or can it be varying as well? That's a good question. So let me just uh, skip ahead. I think we got this far last time. Remember that um, in, the MIP, uh, in the MIP algorithm created by uh, Nick Cheney, the genome contains a pair of CPPNs, and the phenotype is one of these soft simulated robots. The first CPPN constructs the morphology of the robot, and the second CPPN paints a controller onto that robot. It's a very simple controller. It's just, uh, it paints a frequency at which the voxels increase or decrease in volume. So you can imagine that each voxel contains a CPG, or a central pattern generator. Remember, CPGs just emit a constant sine wave. 
So if you think of a CPG existing in each voxel, that CPG is going to command the voxel to increase or decrease in volume. And the frequency at which the CPG does that is painted onto that voxel by CPPN2. It is also going to paint on a phase offset to that CPG. So if we have two voxels next to one another, each one has its own CPG in it. Um, and those CPGs are going to beat uh, with a, a, a in phase with one another or very, um, they, each one has its own phase. So I can't really do this with my hands, but you can imagine them beating an antiphase or in phase with one another. Two voxels may be in phase with one another. Another pair of voxels may be out of phase. Each voxel has its own phase offset and frequency. Yeah. Okay. So this is the genome. The CPPN pair and the phenotype is the soft robot. So back to Daniel's question. Um, every time uh, a robot survives in the population, there's a robot on the Pareto front and, we pr and it's allowed to produce a child robot, we take the CPPN pair of that parent robot, copy that CPPN pair, and flip a coin. Heads, we mutate CPPN1. Tails, we mutate CPPN2. So there's a 50% probability of one or the other CPPN being mutated. If CPPN1 is mutated, that counts as a morphological mutation. And the age since last morphological mutation in that new robot is set to zero. If the mutation falls into CPPN2, then we're mutating the controller of the robot, but not its body and that robot has to walk backwards through its ancestors to find the, la the first one that suffered a morphological mutation. And that's, we set its age to be that number of generations since the last morphological mutation. Make sense, Daniel? Does that answer your question? Okay, I realize I'm, I'm repeating myself here at the beginning of this lecture, but I think this was a lot of new material, um, so I think it was worth going over it again. So you can see the phenotypes here, each phenotype one after the other. And again, uh, you can see that evolution is altering uh, the, uh, the body plans and the uh, controllers in these robots and the distribution of material properties. So we're using MIP, the MIP algorithm, and we're the MIP algorithm is evolving pairs of CPPNs. Pairs of CPPNs are creating simulated soft robots and each simulated soft robot is being simulated in a soft robot simulator called VoxCAD, V-O-X-C-A-D. Okay. So what happens, uh, what, what happens, I think we ended with this slide last time, we have the number of generations on the horizontal axis, and as I told you last time, Nick ran this on NASA's uh, supercomputer, the Pleiades cluster, um, so he had a lot of computation at his disposal. So he was able to run his evolutionary algorithm not for a few hundred generations, but for a few thousand generations. Uh, each uh, colored line here corresponds to a particular, uh, a particular lineage, as you see here. Remember, all the robots are related in that lineage. Um, and what you're looking at here is not the MIP algorithm, but this is the algorithm that uh, Nick compared MIP to, which is AFPO. Uh, and just as a reminder, AFPO is trying to minimize the age uh, of robots lineage and also minimize one over fitness. And what we can see here is that AFPO didn't work very well. It made progress for uh, about 100 generations, and then there was no more evolutionary progress. So all of this computation on the Pleiades supercomputer was wasted. And we can then ask the question of why. Why did evolution perform so poorly here? The answer, as you can probably imagine from all of this lead up, the reason is that uh, evolution is able to make a change to the body, um, but after a while, once we have a relatively fast-moving robot, any change to that robot's body in a child robot is likely to disrupt the gait, and that child robot that has a body that's different from the parent travels much slower than the parent, 
and it's thrown out of the gener it's thrown out of the population it's deleted and evolution keeps trying to make uh, copies of uh, the parents that survive but it's never able to make a move in morphospace the space of all possible the space of all possible bodies Morphospace is a term borrowed from uh, biology, or evolutionary biology. Um, you can think about the morphospace of organisms, and if you think of each species on Earth as a point in morphospace, um, then morphospace is very sparse. There are a pos an infinite number of body plans that evolution could have discovered uh, in the last 4.5 billion years, but for various reasons did not. Okay. Uh, we don't know how easy or hard it is for biological evolution to explore morphospace, meaning to move, uh, to make slight changes to the body plan and increase fitness for that individual or that species. But clearly, if we take AFPO and we broaden AFPO and allow it to make changes to both the body and neural controller of the robot, it doesn't make a lot of progress. But if we switch from the AFPO algorithm to the MIP algorithm, we get this instead. So I'm going to just flip back and forth between these. You can see, obviously, that, the, uh, that evolution is having a much easier time. Evolution is continuing to find robots that travel faster and faster than any robots evolution has found so far. And even after more than 6,000 generations, evolution is not only finding faster moving robots, but it's finding robots that have different body plans. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke here. Um, each colored line corresponds to robots that have the same morphology, but different controllers. Okay, so let's look at one of the curved lines here. Uh, if you can actually, let's take, it's easier to see here. Let's go back to the inset picture here. So this red trajectory here, these red robots, they're all related to one another. They all have the same morphology, but each one has a control mutation that is allowing evolution to better exploit the embodiment of that particular morphology. The blue robots all have exactly the same body, but the, and that body is different from the red robots. And similarly, evolution starts to, once this new morphology appears in the population through a morphological mutation, evolution starts making control mutations in the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and those uh, those children are moving faster and faster and faster. So the red robots and the blue robots and the green robots that eventually take over in this inset image you see here, uh, they may actually all be related, but they may be separated. The blue robots are separated from the red robots by one morphological mutation. The red robots may be, uh, their blue robots may be separated from the green robots by one morphological mutation. But all the green robots are also related, they're separated by control mutations. I hope that makes sense. Again, if you have any questions or if I can clarify, please type your question into chat. Let me again go back and forth. This is AFPO, Evolving Bodies and Brains. This is MIP, Evolving Bodies and Brains. If you look at the inset axes in the top right here, you can see the only thing that's changing between AFPO and MIP is this second objective, the time since morphological mutation. So what, we, what Nick has realized here in the MIP algorithm has been sort of the dream of evolutionary robotics since the beginning, which is, that, uh, which is that if we just throw more and more computation at the problem, in this case a quite considerable amount of computation, evolution will continue to discover ever new robots that have different bodies and different neural controllers. And not only are we solving the problem better, but we're coming up with lots of diverse solutions, robots that have very different body plans. Okay. If there aren't any questions, I'm going to move on. 
Let's actually look at some of the robots that were involved in this experiment. What you're looking at here is in the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, the 10 rows that you see here. These correspond to 10 different evolutionary runs of AFPO, the control experiment. The leftmost, the leftmost column represents the best robot from that particular evolutionary run discovered in the first generation, the best robot in the population at the 10th generation, 50th generation, 100, and so on up to 5,000. So we have evolutionary time along the horizontal axis. Uh, Mark has a question. Why do the lines all rise almost straight up at the beginning and then flatten out towards the end? Uh, that is a very good question. So if you look at any one colored line, like the red uh, line here, we have the ro initial robot down here, which is the recipient of a morphological mutation. And then it has a whole bunch of descendants that have uh, an increasing number of control mutations occurring to them. Why is there rapid fitness improvement and then gradually flattening out? You've probably seen this in your own uh, evolutionary uh, algorithms. When we start with some new material, or when you start an evolutionary run, it is very easy for evolution to make random changes and improve them. We put a whole bunch of random electronics together and start changing the electronics a little bit. We may actually be able to make some improvements in pushing this pile of electronics towards uh, acting as a computer. But if we have a highly optimized computer like a Mac or a, a PC and we start to make random modifications to it, it's very unlikely that we're gonna make any improvements. And even if we do manage to make improvements, they're gonna be very slight, right? So this is not, this logarithmic curve is not unlike what you've seen before. Evolution has discovered a new point in morphospace. It's discovered a new body plan. And evolution is then exploring different controllers to get that body plan to move quickly, which is the vertical axis. Uh, it's easily able to find such control mutations that move that new morphology quickly, but it gradually starts to run out of gas after a while. Okay. All right, so back to this picture. Again, uh, rows correspond to individual evolutionary runs, and columns marching from left to right represent evolutionary time. Uh, the color of the robot represents its fitness, so very cool colors, purples and blues, uh, represent very slow-moving robots, and hot colors, reds and oranges and yellows, represent very fast-moving robots. You'll notice that all the robots in this picture, even after 5,000 generations, have relatively cool colors because they're moving relatively slowly. These are 10 evolutionary runs performed using AFPO. And as we already saw in AFPO, it doesn't make much progress after the first 100 generations or so. Let's take run 21 here at the top, this top row. You'll notice that the best robot in the population at generation zero is more or less a full cube. And with, uh, uh, within about 10 generations, after a few morphological mutations that are not protected, this is AFPO, it finds this design that goes a little bit faster than the full cube from generation zero. This, uh, you'll, and you can tell because this is blue and this is purple. However, um, in the next 4,900 generations, there is little to no change in the morphology of this robot. So this robot produced these descendants, which have more or less the same body as the ancestral robot. And with some few control changes, these robots travel a little bit faster, but not that much faster. So evolution, at least among the champions, or the most fit individuals in the population at any given time in evolutionary run number 21. Uh, this uh, run 21 has sort of explored two points in morphospace, the full cube and this triangular solid. Run number four also seemed to discover this full cube early on. Uh, and then, again, at about generation 50, it had uh, evolved this shape, and there was very little change in this shape in the remaining 
4,900 generation. So evolution seems to sort of explore morphospace or explores different kinds of morphologies early on in evolution, but then pretty quickly gets stuck and only makes improvements in fitness by changing the controller for that robot rather than its morphology. So if you look along each row, you can see there's relatively little change in the body plan. Run number two here never actually escaped this full cube morphology. Same thing for run 26 uh, and so on. So a little bit of morphological innovation early on, but then that's it for the rest of evolution. These are the 10, uh, 10 runs from AFPO. Here are 10 runs from MIP. And again, you can see the situation is very different. I'm going to leave the slide here for a moment. What's different? What can you tell me about what happened in these 10 runs of MIP compared to the 10 runs of AFPO? If you have an idea, please go ahead and type it into chat. Uh, exactly. It kept changing the it kept changing the body plan. So you can see that in any any one uh, run here, there are quite a few different body plans. Um, somewhere between generation one hundred and generation five hundred, somewhere between generation one hundred and generation five hundred, a morphological mutation produced. Uh, this body plan and then there were some changes to it and some considerable changes to it along the way. In run three this was the best body plan in the first generation and then within ten generations it had found these other morphologies and made changes to them and changes to them uh, and so on. So you'll notice that in each individual run evolution is exploring more of the morphospace than AFPO ever does. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, we can see an additional phenomenon occurring in uh, MIP, which is known as convergent evolution. And what we mean by that here, obviously, is that in all 10 runs, the 10 evolutionary trajectories are converging on the same solution. So for some reason, uh, this particular body plan works particularly well. We can see that once this body plan is found, um, the, the greenish color represents the robot is moving at sort of medium speed, or the, the medium speed that was ever seen in these runs. But with subsequent control mutations, evolution can turn these robots hot. It can get these robots to move very quickly. So uh, not only is each individual run exploring a lot of morpho space, but by moving between a lot of different body plans, it eventually finds the body plan, at least in, the, in this setting, that uh, with some additional control mutations moves particularly quickly. Okay, so um, just to sort of end here, I'm going to end this lecture here. As I mentioned, this algorithm has uh, worked by taking evolution, and evolution, unlike most machine learning algorithms, is able to simultaneously alter the physical structure and the neural controller of the robot. Usually when that happens, it doesn't work very well because any change to the body breaks the controller and possibly vice versa. Any change to the controller might break the body. So Nick actually tried that experiment, which is to run a, a variation of MIP in which, uh, instead of measuring the number of generations since the last morphological mutation, he looked at the number of generations since the last control mutation. And it turns out you do not get this picture. So uh, this is kind of a subtle point, and maybe this is just for the, the graduate students out there, but what that means is there's some important difference between morphology and control. Having longer legs is dangerous in the sense of the moment that longer legs appear, it, can, it breaks the controller. But longer legs have a, something special, which is they provide potential 
for the robot to do something it couldn't do before, like move quicker. Uh, Daniel says, does this mean that there is only one morphology that is the best in terms of covering distance? Remember that we can't say because we don't know what else is out there in morphospace. There may be other morphologies other than this one that coupled with the right controller, that morphology would tra that robot would travel even faster than these robots. All we know is that evolution could never find it. So that situation, if we draw this with a fitness landscape, perhaps this particular robot that we're seeing here, is sitting somewhere on a, uh, a relatively high peak, uh, and it's a peak with a wide basin of attraction. There's lots of neighboring morphologies, or morphologies that are similar, but eventually lead to this morphology, and a few more control mutations climb that peak to here. However, in morphal space, in the space of all possible morphologies, if you think of that as the horizontal axis, there may be uh, a peak that's higher, meaning there's another morphology that with the right controller travels even faster, but it has a smaller basin of attraction. There, it's harder for evolution to find it. This could be something like um, wheels in biology. So organisms never discovered the wheel, with the exception of this species, which did it through conscious thought. Um, and there, it may be just that it's very difficult for evolution to make the right series of mutations that create a wheel on an axle, um, and that wheel is actually placed on an organism in which there's relatively flat ground so that a wheel is useful. It's hard to say. Remember that this is not the, also, this is not the best morphology in general. This is just the best morphology if we're using the VoxCAD simulator, we're simulating voxels with this particular kind of controller. This is not a neural controller. It is an open loop controller, something we talked about before. If we made a change to the simulator or the fitness function, Um, or the way we encode the robot in CPPNs, perhaps there would be another morphology that is the best one. Okay, any other questions before we move on to the very final lecture uh, in the course? No? Okay. Okay, so we have covered uh, a lot of ground. We've covered a lot of ground uh, in this course. Uh, we started with the history of evolutionary robotics, which just doesn't go back that far. It goes back to the early 1990s, but we're going to end this course with uh, a very recent experiment. This is an experiment, again, from, from my group, um, where we produced uh, arguably the world's first computer-designed uh, computer organisms, which uh, have been nicknamed the Xenobots. Uh, as, as you may remember from the beginning of the semester, we published uh, this work on xenobots in January, uh, and because these are robots not made from metal and ceramics, these are robots that are made out of frog cells, as you can imagine. Uh, that was a, a, a fair bit of interest to the global media market and the general public. We got a lot of uh, interest in this. Um, so you're, you're going to hear about some results now in an experiment that is sort of the... Uh, if you'll permit me to say so, the cutting edge in evolutionary robotics, the latest advance we've been able to make in this field. Okay, so uh, as promised, we're going to talk about uh, the xenobots, more formally known as uh, computer-designed organisms. This was work that was primarily led by my PhD student, Sam Kriegman. Um, some of you may know Sam, he's uh, still here finishing up his PhD. Uh, and we worked on the uh, evolutionary algorithm side and the simulation side of this. Sam created an evolutionary algorithm that evolves soft robots using CPPNs in VoxCAD, like you just saw. Here's one of the evolved solutions on the left. Our biology colleagues at Tufts, uh, Doug Blackiston and Michael Levin, then took that simulated uh, blueprint and actually built some of these designs from frog cells. Very, very simple idea to grasp, um, very difficult uh, to do in practice, and there are a lot of hidden details to make this work well, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay, I'm going to do this by gradually uh, revealing uh, the pseudocode that, uh, that describes this whole project. 
Um, in this algorithm, what you're going to see is an outer loop uh, of training that lies outside the evolutionary algorithm. And what do I mean by that? That means we're going to run one evolutionary algorithm to design one or a few xenobots. We are then going to deploy those, uh, those into reality. So we're going to try and cross the sim to real gap. And in some cases we're going to do well, in some cases we're going to do poorly, and uh, we're going to use the information, information that we obtained from our attempted sim to real transferal to alter our evolutionary algorithm and then redesign a new batch of simulated xenobots, try and deploy them to the field, and so on. So we're going to do multiple iterations of sim to real, and during each iteration we're going to do and we're going to run an evolutionary algorithm. Okay, so um, here's the link to the paper itself. I assigned it as reading for today. I don't expect you to read the whole paper, uh, just parts of it. You can also go to uh, cdorgs.github.io. There's all the images and video uh, and lots of other material. There's a pointer to the code itself. If you want to download it and play around with it, you're, you're more than welcome to. Okay. So let's have a look at some of the, uh, let's have a look at this outer loop first. What do we need if we're going to try and automatically design and deploy robots made from biological cells? What do we need to supply to the algorithm? The first thing we need to supply is uh, uppercase T, the training tasks. For our purposes, you can think of this as F or the fitness function. So we basically need to tell the algorithm what do we want the xenobots eventually to do. We then need to describe to the algorithm the building blocks. What are the things from which these agents can be built up? Um, this is going to be represented by beta for building blocks. Uh, in the work that you've done, um, beta contains uh, cylind uh, cylinders, rectangular solids, hinge joints, uh, light sensors, ray sensors, um, uh, linear actuators, and so on. Those are the building blocks that you've been working with in PyroSim. As you just saw, uh, as you just saw in, the, in Nick's work, we could also, uh, we could also specify as the building blocks um, voxels, these soft voxels, which are going to be simulated analogs of the cells out of which we're eventually going to build the xenobots. Okay, we're also going to feed into this algorithm uh, some other parameters uh, represented by theta here. We have theta sub sigma and theta sub r. I'm not going to talk about theta for the moment, but what I, uh, for our purposes, I want you to think of these thetas as things that alter the simulator. And thetas are going to parameterize the simulator, they're parameters. They're going to try and alter the simulator in such a way that when we evolve simulated xenobots, we increase the probability that any of those evolved simulated xenobots will transfer well to reality. Okay, so we're gonna then on line number two here, we're gonna run this infinite loop We're gonna run it forever. Uh, on line three, we're going to uh, evolve an agent. On line four, we're then going to deploy that agent. Our colleagues at Tufts are going to actually build that, the, this agent blueprint out of cells and deploy it. Line five, we're going to try and recover the agent from the field and get information back about how well it did. And on line six, depending on if it performed poorly or we were never able to recover the agent, we're going to modify theta. And by modifying theta, theta is the thetas in turn are going to modify the simulator. We're going to go back to line three. We're going to evolve new agents, deploy them to the field, collect them from the field. Depending on how well they do, that's going to dictate how we modify the simulator again, and around and around we go. So we have this outer loop now, and each iteration through the loop, we're going to run one evolutionary algorithm and conduct one or more, uh, run one or more evolutionary algorithms and do one or more deployments. So far, so good? Okay. All right, so let's have a look at line three. On line three, we're training an agent. So this is going to be algorithm 1.1. This is the one that's actually going to look most familiar to you. 
So we just looked at this outer loop. Inside this outer loop, there is a middle loop of training, which is the evolutionary uh, algorithm. On line one, we're going to start by randomly generating a population of bodies. And we're going to generate these bodies using CPPNs, as we've seen before. We're going to use this CPPN to paint we're going to feed in the X, Y, and Z coordinates of a series of points inside this empty 3D cage, like we, like we, exactly like we saw in the previous lecture. And this CPPN is going to either place voxels or not place a voxel or not place a voxel at each of these points inside the cage. If there is a voxel that is placed there, in Nick's earlier work, we could paint that voxel with one of four colors. Red and green are voxels that increase or decrease their volume and antiphase with one another. The light blue voxels were passive soft material like fat that could be passively pushed or pulled by muscle groups. And although you can't see it in this picture here, there was a fourth type which was dark blue voxels. And dark blue voxels are meant to, are passive and rigid. They're meant to be support structure like bone. In the, in the Xenobots project here, the CPPN is going to only be able to pick from one of two materials, frog skin cells and frog muscle cells. We'll come back to that in a moment. Okay. If we create a random CPPN, um, it produces a random robot like you see here. Again, you can see there's three colors, so this is not a simulated Xenobot. This is a simulated soft robot from Nick's earlier work. I've included a link here now to uh, VoxCAD. Um, we've actually made some modifications to VoxCAD and we've uh, adapted it so it now runs on GPUs, which means that we can now simulate robots that are made up not of uh, a dozen or a hundred or a few hundred voxels, but a thousand, uh, several thousand, all the way up to a million voxels in near real time. So this is kind of state-of-the-art uh, soft body simulation. You're welcome to go and play around with it if you like, if you have access. Generations. So we're going to set the number of generations we want to run our evolutionary algorithm for. And for each body in the population, or each CPPN, for each body in the population or each uh, CPPN, on line four, we could train a policy on it. Just like we saw in the previous experiment where we had pairs of CPPNs. One CPPN specified the body and the other specified uh, the brain. In the simulated xenobots, there's going to be no brain whatsoever. There is only going to be body, and that body is some arbitrary collection of voxels. And voxels are either frog skin cells, which are passive soft material, and they can be pulled or pushed by frog muscle cells. And the frog muscle cells are going to just increase and decrease in volume. There is no controller. It can be a little confusing, and we'll, we'll revisit this several times in this lecture. So in the, most of the work that you've seen so far, we as the, as the investigator built the body by hand, like you did in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the projects, in the assignments, I'm sorry. You let evolution tinker with the neural controller. So you set the body, and evolution played with the controller. In the last few lectures, we've seen an evolutionary algorithm that is tinkering with both the body and the brain. In this very final lecture, there is only going to be a body. There is no brain. Xenobots have no neurons or synapses or brains in them. Evolution is only tinkering with the body. So we're going to ignore algorithm 1.2 here. We're going to just skip over line 4. And we're just going to repeat this process. So again, I won't show you this. This I'm just going to. I'll show you parts. Of, I guess I'll just show you this video again. Maybe it's helpful. So just as a reminder, in algorithm 1.1, in this middle loop, 
We start by creating a population of random CBPNs on uh, line one. Uh, and then we repeat on line two, we're going to iterate through a few hundred or a few thousand generations. We're going to evaluate each body in a simulation and uh, repeat this process. Uh, in, this, in this particular work here, Sam did not use MIP because there is no body and brain um, to protect. There's only a body, so uh, Sam used just AFPO, and AFPO seemed to work pretty well under these settings. As you can see, um, at, up to a, a thousand generations, AFPO is still making uh, improvements. Why is that the case? There, that's the case because there is no controller. There's just the body. So slight changes to the body here lead to incre increasing uh, fitness even after several hundred generations have elapsed. Okay. So we repeat this process and once we've exhausted, once we've run through all several hundred or several thousand uh, generations, this algorithm is going to return the champion, the best body. We throw away the CPPN that produces this body and just return this body to line three. In the experiments you're going to see here, instead of sending just this one design to our biology colleagues at Tufts, we, re we ran line three 100 times. And that gave us back these 100 bodies. You'll notice a few things here. First of all, you'll notice that in each of these 100 evolutionary runs that we performed, where we started with a different random population of CPPNs each time, the evolutionary algorithm ended up with a different body plan in each, ca in each case. You'll also notice that each body is completely red. In this simulation, although I haven't shown it yet, there is uh, red cells and, and light blue cells, or cyan cells. The red cells are meant to represent frog muscle cells that are going to just beat at a, at a set frequency. They're going to increase and decrease. And the cyan voxels are passive, soft material. The fitness function here was just displacement, move as quickly as possible. And so like we saw in Nick's work before, evolution always converges, not in this case on the same shape, but the same general strategy, which is to create a ball of muscle. Um, in this particular case, we're going to assume that all of the frog uh, heart cells are going to beat at the same with the same phase offset. They're all going to increase or decrease together. The reason we assume that is our best understanding of frog muscle cells when we first started this project was if you put heart muscle cells together in arbitrary combinations, they will spontaneously connect with one another, they will quote unquote talk to one another, and they will synchronize their beat. This was an assumption we made, which as you will see in a few slides turned out to be wrong. All right, so we have these 100 designs. We then sent them to our biology colleagues and they then went about trying to build them. And for most people, this was the, the most exciting part of this project. So I'm gonna walk you through a series of 10 short videos showing how uh, Doug Blackiston uh, actually built, the, built some of these designs using frog, uh, using frog cells. So he took, he picked one of these 100 designs that he thought he could actually build. Some of these are more difficult to build than others. We'll talk about why that's the case in a moment. He took a series of fertile, early, fertilized early frog embryos. So these are uh, frog embryos that are very early in development. They're nowhere near turning into tadpoles yet. And it seems I have a relatively poor internet connection today. So hope that, let me just refresh and see if that will help us. If I can bring up the videos for you. Let's try going to YouTube. Maybe we'll have a little bit better luck there.
Hmm. Well, this is going... Oh, here we go. Okay. So what you see here, each of these large uh, spheres is a fertilized... Uh, early uh, fertilized frog embryo. Doug is looking through a microscope at these uh, embryos and he is injecting some uh, RNA and that RNA is going to be a marker that's going to uh, influence some of the cells in these embryos to turn into skin cells and some of them to turn into muscle cells. Okay. Uh, once that's been done, uh, he then takes uh, takes one of these embryos. And he's going to remove what's known as the vitaline membrane. This is kind of the egg sac or sort of the, uh, the goo around each one of these embryos. He's going to remove it to try and get at the cells underneath. As you can see, he's looking through a microscope and using micro forceps, so this is very difficult work. Um, Doug was telling us that he often recruits students to work with him. He looks for students that are very good at video games because they have very good hand-eye coordination. This is, a very, uh, this is a very difficult thing to do. You're making very small cuts to a very, very small object. And see him removing the vitaline membrane from a second embryo here. I'll just let this play so you get a sense of uh, how painstaking it is to actually go about building one of these 100 designs. Okay. So after he's removed uh, the vital line membrane, he's going to remove uh, the animal cap. So we're going to look for uh, just he's, he wants to harvest some cells from these embryos. We're going to take embryos from just one part. That we're going to take cells from just one part of the embryo. So he's going to cut off the cap, the top, the top bit of the embryo. Each of these caps contains about 20,000 cells. We're going, to, we're going to use about that many cells, or maybe a, a, some. We're going to use about that number of cells to build most of the xenobots here. The white material that you see underneath are the cells, and this uh, the there's this covering, dark covering on top. Uh, which is the ectoderm, the the uh, outer surface of the skin. Did I miss one? No. Ah, here we go. Okay. So now that he's cut off these caps, we have these these caps now, and he's going to remove the dark material, the ectoderm, from the inner cells. You'll see that the cells underneath are are sort of dissociated. There, some of them are are attached to one another, but they're also sort of free floating. The idea is we're trying to liberate this raw material for building, these cells underneath uh, the ectoderm. Uh, EBC say, says, ironically, maybe we should use a robot to do this in the future. That's absolutely right. Um, as you can tell in the Xenobots project, design was automated, but manufacture was very much uh, manual. Uh, as you can probably imagine, we are now working on methods to automate the manufacture of a given Xenobot. But in this first attempt, it was all manual. Okay, so once we've removed the ectoderm, we have sort of pure uh, dissociated cells left. We are now going to try and pull these cells into uh, very small indentations in a petri dish. 
So we're looking down into a petri dish, and this dark region here is a little concavity, a little well, and you can see he is now eject injecting these dissociated cells, and they happen to just sit in this well. Um, you can see, obviously, that some of these cells are expanding out into a fluid. This is basically just fresh water at room temperature because, of course, that's the environment for frogs. And they are then left... Uh, let's see here. I think we may be seeing more or less the same thing in this video. Once those dissociated 20,000 cells or so are left in their own uh, well, This is just another video of the same process. Oh yeah, this is just another view on the same process. So you can see if you look inside the syringe itself, um, the cells are all dissociated. They're not part of a growing frog anymore. They have been liberated or freed from the developmental trajectory of this frog species. We talked about, uh, we talked about uh, we talked about developmental trajectories before, which is the DNA inside the cells plus the way the cells are connected together seem to lead to, in this case, an adult frog. The question is, what happens if we pull cells out of a developing embryo like this and perturb them or do other things to them? Will they spontaneously clump back together and grow another frog, or will they grow into something else? Uh, Mark asks, how big are the cells? Um, you're going to see the xenobots in the moment, in a moment, which are made up of about 20,000 uh, cells, and they are less than a millimeter across. So uh, if you take, a, actually there's 750 micrometers across. So if you take that number and divide by about 20,000, that's the width of a, a cell. So very, very small. So uh, basically the width of this uh, the width of the well here is about uh, uh, one millimeter across, slightly less than one millimeter across. Okay, um, after Doug had injected these dissociated cells into these wells, he left them uh, to their own devices for about two days, and over this two-day process, you can see that these cells have a bit of a mind of their own. They will, uh, left to their own devices, they try to connect with one another and gradually re-adhere and compress back down into a ball of cells. So unlike other building materials like metal and ceramics that are just dumb materials and they'll do what we tell them or they'll break, in this case we're working with things that have their own agendas. They are trying to do certain things, and we don't quite understand what all those things are, uh, especially when they're not trying to build an adult frog. They've been pushed outside of their comfort zone, and they're trying to do something else. This is a, a different view on a larger clump, again, sped up over about uh, two weeks, and you can see these dissociated cells gradually connecting with one another and tightening their connections, re-adhering, re-compressing, and creating a sphere of spheres. Okay. Once that's happened, uh, oh, so one other thing I wanted to mention, I forgot to mention, I mentioned that each of these designs not only dictates the three-dimensional shape of uh, a given xenobot, not just uh, it dictates the 3D shape, but it also dictates where to place muscle versus skin. So in these dissociated cells that you see, uh, obviously in real life they're not colored different colors, which would be nice and make things easier on us. Some of the cells here are going to develop into, they, these are mostly stem cells, but they've been injected with this MRI, M, they've been injected with this RNA and some other uh, chemicals, some other proteins. They're going to cause some of these cells to turn into skin cells and some of these stem cells to turn into muscle cells. 
Uh, Daniel says we can think of cells having this inherent, ab inherent ability to clump together to make something. Maybe that's why the cells started to clump together. That's right. They have this inherent ability to do that. That's kind of what they want to do when they're left to their own devices. Okay, so we're injecting, uh, as, you, as you saw, uh, Mark, uh, I'm sorry, Doug is injecting or pushing these dissociate cells into these wells. In this first round, as you can see, these are all, all, all the designs are basically clumps of muscle. Some of the designs, however, say, put a clump of skin cells here, put a clump of muscle cells here, put another clump of skin cells here, and so on. Doug can do that by, by injecting or laying down some skin cells, then some muscle cells on top, skin cells on top, muscle cells on top, skin cells on top of that. And then as you're going to see, he's going to scrape away material. And that's how he's able to more or less put skin cells where the evolved design says to put skin cells and where to put muscle cells according to where the evolved design says to place muscle cells. Can't see that obviously in these videos, they all the cells look alike. Okay, once we have this ball of cells, some of which are going to become skin cells and some of which are gonna become muscle cells, as you'll see in this video, uh, Doug is going to use two tools, a, mic a micro cauterization tool, which is something that's going to go in and burn away some material. There's the cauterization uh, tool you see on the right. So he's able to burn away or remove a small uh, patch of cells. And a micro, micro scalper or calipers on the, on the left, he's able to hold and cut and shape this clump as he sees fit. Okay, this video is three minutes long, so I'm going to just speed this up a little bit. You can see he's burned this uh, small cross section into into the ball, and he's now using uh, he's using a very small. <laughs> pair of pliers to increase the width of this well, this cross section. What he's actually doing here is taking a design that's basically a, a soft quadruped, not unlike what you built in PyroSim, uh, and he's trying to build that design. So we're, he's going to end up with something that's got very small, uh, four small stubby legs. I'll let you watch a little bit more of this. You get a sense of how difficult this is to do. Okay. This is a time lapse. Uh, this this video is basically just going to jump ahead now towards uh, showing the, uh, Doug putting the finish, finishing touches on this quadrupedal design. As I mentioned, uh, these dissociated cells, so this is after about two days after having been uh, injected into this well. Once he's built this design, he leaves it for another couple of days and there is a temptation or the cells want to still clump together, but they've been pushed far enough apart now that he also uh, injects a, a small, he injects, uh, in this case, he injects a small amount of an additional chemical that tries to uh, that tries to cause these robot cause these cells to not reclump together, to basically hold the shape. And you can see the target shape uh, that he eventually was able to achieve here. What you're seeing in this target shape that he finally made, um, these cells have now settled down. They basically resisted or stopped trying to form back into a sphere of spheres. They will actually hold the shape for another seven to ten days. 
Um, in this first design that you see here, uh, this was just a test. What Doug was actually doing is building a Xenobot that is actually a sculpture, not a robot. This particular Xenobot is only made from skin cells, not from muscle cells, so it cannot move. Uh, it was a demonstration at the beginning of this experiment that this could actually be done, that they could actually construct one of our evolved designs from uh, frog cells. Since there's only skin cells here, there's no stomach, there's no way for this creature to extract energy from its environment. So these cells internally metabolize or use whatever, uh, whatever fatty deposits, or whatever energy stores they have inside the cells. And once they've exhausted those, uh, those energies, the cells start to decay and this whole thing just degrades and, and dies away. Okay, I think we're going to pause there. Uh, you have a quiz due uh, tonight. We will see you back here on the Twitch stream Thursday morning, where for the UVM students, I will go through exactly what's expected uh, for the oral presentations and give you instructions about how to prepare for that. Uh, I wish you uh, all the best for uh, the rest of the, uh, the week. And again, I'll see you on Thursday. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.